Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for inviting me. So today I'm going to talk about a new work called uh, Beyond Lazy Training for Overprime Trans Tensor Decomposition. Uh, so this might be a strange topic uh, for some people at this workshop, but let me first uh, explain uh, what the title means, like what do I mean by overprime price uh, tensor decomposition and what it means to have the lazy training regime. Uh, so this is based on joint work with my students, Xiang Wang and Chen Wei Wu, uh, and also uh, other people, Jason Li and Tong Yu Ma. Uh, so uh, let's first uh, look at a basic tensor decomposition question. So suppose we are given a elf order tensor, T star that, that has rank R in this form. So T star is the summation over R components where each component is some CI star times UI star tensor itself L times. Uh, so it's, uh, T star is a symmetric uh, order L tensor uh, of rank R. So given this T star, um, a very common um, plan or a very common task that we want to solve is to find uh, number ci and vectors ui such that uh, t star is actually equal to this decomposition of summation i from one to r ci times ui tensor to the l. Uh, obviously, a possible solution of that is just to assign ci to ci star and ui to ui star. Okay, and if we can always do this consistently, uh, this solves the tensor cp decomposition problem. And uh, so there are many algorithms for tensor CTP decomposition, but in this talk, we are actually going to focus on a fairly naive algorithm. We are just going to run gradient descent on this very simple objective that's trying to minimize the probability storm difference between T star and T. So T star is this ground truth tensor that we are given, and T is uh, this tensor that has the CP decomposition form of summation CI UI tensor to the L. Um, so we want to run gradient descent on the parameters ci and ui uh, and try to uh, find a good CP decomposition of the tensor T star. Uh, so, so first, would this work? Uh, if you just think about it for a little bit, it's going to be fairly clear that this would fail for many different cases. Um, so this many algorithm fails because uh, of course, in the worst case, if you are trying to compute the rank of a tensor, uh, even in this case, we are restricting to a symmetric tensor, that's still an empty hard problem. So even if you are not using some na naive algorithm like gradient descent, even if you can design the best algorithm you have, uh, you will still not be able to find this decomposition consistently in the worst case. Uh, but gradient descent is actually uh, even worse compared to the best algorithms that we can design. Uh, in fact, uh, you can run experiments and show that gradient descent with random initialization often gets stuck even when the original tensor is orthogonally decomposable, uh, which means the ground truth components UI stars are orthogonal to each other. So in that case, there are a lot of algorithms for uh, computing the CP decomposition of the tensor, but gradient descent would still fail to, uh, to recover the CP decomposition. Uh, so in order to get around these problems, uh, so what we are going to consider is a technique that's called overprime transition. So we are going to allow this tensor T to have M different components where M potentially is going to be much larger than R. Okay, and the question we are going to think about uh, so the, what I call the overprime tries tensor decomposition problem in the title is the problem of minimizing this objective star where T star is a rank R tensor, uh, but T, uh, instead of parameterizing, it has R different components. We parameterize it so that it has M components where M is larger than R. Uh, so the question that I would like to ask is how large does this M need to be in order for an algorithm like gradient descent to be able to optimize this objective. Uh, and obviously we know the minimum of this objective should be at zero because uh, even if M is equal to R, uh, there should be an optimal solution where CI is equal to CI star and UI is equal to UI star. Uh, and in that case, T is equal to T star and the objective value is going to be zero. Uh, 
Okay, uh, so the question is how large does M need to be? Um, so what we can show is uh, M, uh, even if you don't assume any special structure of the original tensor, other than that it is of rank R, uh, you can have M is equal to something like R to power order L over poly epsilon number uh, of components. When M is this large, uh, there's a variant of gradient descent algorithm that can optimize this objective function star with accuracy epsilon, which means it gets a tensor T that's within uh, distance epsilon uh, to the ground truth tensor T star. And this happens in polynomial number of iterations. Uh, so uh, our result does not need to assume any structure on the ground truth tensor T star. Um, well, uh, obviously a, a lot of uh, CP decomposition algorithms might uh, need to assume structures on the ground truth tensor or the components of the ground truth tensor. Uh, what I want to emphasize is that uh, even though we have proved this result, um, this result shouldn't be surprising if you are not looking at a gradient descent algorithm. So if I just have a rank R tensor, and I want to represent it. Um, uh, I want to represent it as a summation of M rank one components. How large does M needs to be? Uh, it's actually easy to show that whenever M is as large as R to the power L minus one, uh, then it's always possible to do this, and it's not hard to do that because uh, when your tensor is rank R. You can first, um, even though maybe the um, modes of the tensor are of dimension D, you can first find a dimensional a R dimensional subspace and project everything into that subspace where uh, which is the span of the true components. And once you project everything to the R dimensional subspace, as a tensor become well, you can think the tensor instead of uh, d to the power r dimensions, you can think of the tensor as, uh, sorry, d to the power l dimensions, you can think of the tensor as r to the power l dimensions. And if you have an r to the power l tensor, uh, you can just have r to the power l minus one random components and linear combinations of these components will be able to recover. Um, well, actually uh, you can't use random components, but, but you can use, uh, if you use random components, you need m is equal to r to the l, but you can do something that's a bit better and to get r to the power l minus one. Uh, the simplest setting of this is, of course, if l is equal to two, you have a matrix. Then if you have a rank r matrix, you can always represent it as, a, uh, as r components. Uh, if, r, if you have a third order tensor uh, and you have a rank r third order tensor, you can always represented using R square components. And so the uh, difficulty in proving our theorem is really that you can uh, solve this problem using uh, an easy algorithm such as uh, a variant of gradient descent. Um, so there's uh, actually also a very related work uh, by Yuan Shi Li, Tang Yu Ma, and Hong Yang Zhang, uh, where they show it. Um, so in our case, the our prime transition is not entirely polynomial because it is exponential in this order of tensor L. Uh, so in this related work, they show polynomial over prime transition will work if the tensor is orthogonally uh, decomposable. In, in fact, you can have a polynomial number over prime transition regardless of the order L. Um, so they can use more structure on the ground truth tensor T star, but proving a stronger result. Uh, so, of course, as I explained, you if you just care about our prime size tensor decomposition and not using gradient descent, getting this result is going to be easy. So why do we care about gradient descent? Uh, there are many different reasons. One is gradient descent is a very natural and scalable algorithm. You can easily run gradient descent, and you can also run variants of gradient descent like stochastic gradient descent. Uh, they are quite fast in practice, at least per iteration. Um, so properties you use for analyzing gradient descent can often be useful for analyzing other algorithms. Uh, 
because in many cases, when analyzing gradient descent, you know what are the local optimal solutions and what are the properties around global optimal solutions. Uh, but to me, the original motivation was actually this final motivation that I put in here. So the tensor decomposition problem, in particular, this version of the over prime tries to decomposition problem, is actually closely related to training a two-layer neural network. And uh, of course, in training a neural network, uh, stochastic gradient descent is the default algorithm for training neural networks. So by studying what happens for gradient descent in this tensor decomposition setting, uh, we can also hope to get results uh, or get intuitions about what happens in neural network training. Uh, so let me first uh, explain a little bit of this relationship. So um, to see this relationship, we consider a very simple two-layer neural network uh, where we have input x, and then the hidden layer has a representation, which is a nonlinear function sigma uh, applied to u times x, where we are, for simplicity, we are even thinking u uh, as a square matrix, but it doesn't need to be square. Uh, sigma is applied entry-wise to the vector u times x. Uh, and uh, for neural networks, the typical sigma is going to be the rectified linear unit, um, which just takes a positive part of uh, this particular entry. Uh, without loss of terminology, we are assuming these rows have unit norm. And so output is just a linear function on top of this, um, uh, hidden represent uh, this intermediate representation h. Uh, and again, for uh, simplicity, we are going to assume that uh, input x is drawn from a Gaussian distribution. And uh, so output that you are trying to predict comes from a ground truth neural network with parameters c star and u star. Our goal here is to find a network uh, that has the same output uh, for, for random uh, input x. So for this uh, neural network, you can write a very simple objective, which is just the expectation over x as the output of the ground truth network minus the output of your current neural network squared. Uh, what we were able to show uh, in some previous work was um, if you are assuming that the rows of u star and u are unit norm, which in neural network language just means the neurons, uh, the weights of the neurons are unit norm. Then the objective function, the standard objective function for two -layer training two-layer neural network is actually equivalent to this form. And uh, sorry, um, there's some typo here. It should be a function of ci and ui. And so, um, so it's actually a summation of tensor uh, moment matching uh, objectives where this red part is the else order moment for the true parameters for the ground truths um, a neural network, and uh, this part is the else moment for the current parameters, for the parameters of the network that we are trying to learn. Um, and we want these two uh, else moments to match each other, so we want to minimize their dropping storm squared, and this is multiplied by a coefficient, and this coefficient is actually the else Hermite coefficient for the activation function. Uh, so, uh, in other words, uh, the objective function for optimizing this uh, 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 two-layer neural network is actually a combination of moment matching objectives, where it's a combination of uh, older L tensor decomposition objectives. And here, um, so uh, and for standard uh, redwood activations, the non-zero Hermite coefficients includes one and all the even older terms. Okay, so finally, uh, let me talk about what is lazy training in the title. Lazy training uh, is something that's first studied for neural networks uh, under the name of neural tangent kernel. So neural tangent kernel says, if you run gradient descent on a very wide neural network, uh, then the neural network is actually going to behave like a kernel, and you can prove that the neurons will not move very far. So uh, kind of each neuron, after you randomly initialize them, is going to move within a lo local neighborhood, and one can analyze the dynamics of training uh, in this neural tangent kernel regime. Uh, later, people have observed uh, that a similar, very similar phenomena would happen 
uh, in many different settings of training, including the tensor uh, decomposition setting that we just looked at. And so whether this lazy training regime happens or not really depends on whether your initialization is large or not. If you have a large initialization, you are very likely to get into this lazy training regime where whatever you do is going to be similar to a kernel. Uh, if you have small initialization, it's often possible to get away from this lazy training regime and allow the neurons to work the components that you have to move very far from initialization. Uh, so uh, in the setting of running gradient descent for doing the tensor decomposition, there are actually a lot of difficulties, which is why we are analyzing this problem. Uh, mostly there are three problems. One is that lazy training fails horribly uh, in this gradient descent for all prime trice tensors. And we also show that zero is a higher order saddle point. Uh, so it's actually not very easy to get away from zero if you don't change the algorithm. There are also many local minima away from zero. So we need to do something else to get away from these local minima. Uh, so let's look at some of these difficulties. So first, uh, is that AZ training actually fails horribly in the or prime trace tensor decomposition setting. So what we can show uh, is that the lazy training regime requires M is only at least D to the L minus one components in order to optimize star with even a constant accuracy. And even when the rank of the ground truth tensor is actually one. Uh, and remember uh, we are in our result the number of components required is R to the power order L, where R is the number of components uh, where R is the rank. So uh, in the case when R is much smaller than the ambient dimension, uh, the lazy training is going to uh, give a very bad performance. Uh, so intuitively, the reason why this result holds is in lazy training, you have when you have M components, um, you don't have a lot of flexibility. You can't move too far from the initialization. So these M components is going to actually represent a subspace of M times D dimensions. Uh, and this is a fixed subspace uh, based on your initialization. And then uh, the total dimension of a symmetric tensor, if we consider L as a constant, is roughly D to the power L. Uh, it's D to the power L divided by some amount of symmetry, which is a, a constant for a constant L. Uh, so if you have D to the L dimensions, but your components only cover M times D dimensions, in order to cover all the dimensions, you would need M to be roughly D to the L minus one. So the fix that we have for, the, for, uh, for this is to avoid lazy training instead of using a large initialization, which will naturally lead to a lazy training regime, we'll use a very small initialization. Uh, I thought there's a question. Uh, yeah, there's a uh, hi, uh, question. Great. Uh, yeah, hi, hi Rong. Uh, I, just a quick question. So is this an issue uh, in the matrix case too, or the, it doesn't yeah, This is actually also a case in the matrix setting. In the, well, uh, sorry, in the matrix setting, yeah, even in the matrix setting, uh, for a rank one matrix, you would need uh, M is equal to D uh, in order to represent this rank one matrix. Okay. Okay. So this lazy training fails even there. Yeah, you, lazy training fails even for matrices. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So the next difficulty is that zero is actually a high order saddle point. Uh, so for a single component, um, the scale of CI is actually redundant because we can put the scale into UI. Uh, but if we do that naively, if we set ci to be plus minus one, then zero is going to be an order L saddle point and gradient is going to be very small when the norm of ui is small. And because we use small initialization to avoid lazy training, uh, this would be a problem because it would take a lot of gradient steps for these very small components to become large. So in order to fix that, we actually reparameterize uh, the components as AI times CI to the power L minus two times UI to the tens tensor L. And we fix CI to be one over the norm of UI. Uh, this might seem unnatural to begin with, but, but the intuition of why we are doing this is to make sure that the model is actually too homogeneous in terms of the component UI. So in terms of matrices, this is just 
uh, parameterize as AI times UI, UI transpose. So we are hoping that uh, the dynamics of, of trend in gradient descent on these um, on this parameterization is similar to the dynamics of training uh, things for matrices. Uh, so in the case of matrices, if you run matrix power method, then even though even if a component is small, it's going to grow exponentially. So by using this two homogeneous parameterization, we are also hoping that small components will be able to grow exponentially. And finally, we can show that there are actually bad local minima that are away from zero. Uh, so even if we are able to get away from zero, maybe we will get stuck into these local min optimal solutions. So in order to avoid this case, in order to escape from these local minima, what we do is we actually reinitialize a small fraction of components randomly in every epoch. Uh, Later, I will give some intuition on why this is actually going to help to escape from a local minimum. Uh, so here's our algorithm. The algorithm, unfortunately, ends up fairly complicated, as you can see. Uh, but instead of reading this algorithm, let, let me just tell you that the first part is saying that we parameterize the components as this two homogeneous parameterization, as I mentioned, and we use a small initialization. And then for each epoch, what we do is we firstly randomly reinitialize some small number of components in order to escape from local minima. And then we run gradient descent and we also fix the scaling of CI to be one over norm of UI. Uh, so that's basically what I have promised in order to get around these difficulties that I mentioned. Uh, there's however one extra step which says we are going to use different step size when the norm of the component is small versus when the norm of the component is large, which we call the scalar mode switch. Um, we don't. Uh, we unfortunately need this step in our proof, but we don't actually know whether this is going to be necessary in the algorithm. Um, yeah, so uh, in the remaining uh, bit of time, I'm going to I'll give you some intuition on how the proof works and why we can prove our results. Uh, so our proof are based on uh, three main observations. So first, we will show that uh, all the iterates after we have the small initialization will remain to what we call the correct subspace, which I will define very soon. Uh, and then we will, uh, I will talk about how one can hope to escape local minima by uh, these random reinitializations. And finally, I will show you how uh, a gradient descent procedure actually naturally amplifies the, small, uh, the initial correlation we get from random initialization uh, by some method that's actually very similar to tensor power method. Uh, so first, what is this correct subspace? So the correct subspace is actually just the span of the ground truth components. It's the span of U1 star, U2 star, all the way to UR star. So S, the correct subspace, have dimension at most R. Uh, and intuitively, if we are able, if we actually know S, as I mentioned, you can just have um, R to the, uh, if we can, uh, if we can run a spectral algorithm where we first find this space S, and then we uh, only have components within the subspace, then we will be done. We will be able to, uh, get m is equal to r to the power l. Uh, so intuitively, we want all the components to be in s. Uh, and we show that we can indeed guarantee that this is the case. We show that when running the gradient as a modified gradient descent algorithm, the total norm in the orthogonal subspace of s does not increase, while the total norm in the subspace s might increase. So combining this fact, uh, with the fact that we are using a very small initialization, we can guarantee that uh, our current tensor T is almost in S tensor L. Uh, T star, of course, is by assumption already in S tensor L. Uh, so now once both T and T star are in S tensor L, what that means is actually we can uh, find a good correlation with T minus T star um, if we just have some random uh, component. So what we can show is... Uh, Ron, just uh, to interrupt to say you've got five minutes. Oh, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 
when both T and T star are in S tensor L, uh, of course, what we were guaranteeing was just T is approximately in S tensor L. But for this lemma, let's focus on the exact case. When both of them are in uh, S tensor L, for a random component U that's also in the subspace S with unit norm, uh, we have that the correlation between U tensor L uh, with T minus T star uh, with some reasonable probability with the constant probability is at least one over R to the L over two. Uh, so this should not be surprising. This is actually a very standard on anti-concentration result. You can just compute the variance and, and see that the variance of this correlation uh, it's, uh, it's going to be one over R. Um, so this is a fairly standard on anti-concentration result. What it shows is if we know that T and T star are both in S tensor L, then uh, if I have a random component uh, also in the subspace S, then it, with some good probability, it's going to have a good correlation. If it has a good correlation, I can just increase this direction. Um, I can just scale up this direction. If I scale up this direction large to be something large enough, then the residual of T minus T star minus some lambda times U tensor L is going to have a small norm, a smaller norm compared to the original T minus T star. Uh, so what we really need to do next is, uh, is actually to somehow increase the norm of such components. And we hope gradient descent will do this naturally. So finally, uh, yes, that's our final step where we amplify the initial correlation by tensor power method. Uh, so we can show that if a vector U satisfies the fact that uh, T minus T star uh, in our product was U tensor L, uh, so this correlation is actually large enough, then the corresponding component will double its norm in drop VC iterations. Um, so if we can guarantee the initial correlation is large, then the norm of the components will actually grow uh, until it's actually very large. Um, so the, the fact that this lemma could happen uh, uses the two homogeneous reprimer transition that we I talked about. Uh, there is a slight problem that U is not initially in S, so the initial correlation C is low. Uh, to fix that, uh, we actually use a much larger learning rate at initialization. We use a much larger learning rate so that the components within the space S actually increase much faster. And once the norm of U inside the subspace S is large, we can use this analysis. So this is the meaning of that scalar mode switch step in our algorithm. But as I mentioned, we are not sure whether this step is actually necessary. Uh, so what we are able to prove in this work is that a variant of gradient descent can actually automatically discover low rank structure in the target tensor. If our T star is of low rank, then we don't need too many components in order to represent T star. Um, and we show that over prime transition can potentially help tensor C to be decomposition. Uh, there are a lot of open problems. First is how can we generalize this result to actually to a layer value network, which is a sum of tensors of different orders. And also we are hoping, uh, in this case, we show gradient descent can discover a low rank structure. Uh, can gradient descent actually discover any other structure? Uh, thanks, and any questions?